Hello. Uh, Fox Trotting asked me a question on Tumblr that I wanted to answer via video. Uh, the question was, I noticed in recent years many popular evil characters are written in a way so that they're too sympathetic or relatable, so that their status as a villain whom the audience should not overly sympathize with is diminished. How does one write a villain or evil character in a way in which their motivations are well-defined and even sympathetic without defeating their purpose in the story? Which I think is a very good question. Um, first, I think it's important to separate villains and antagonists. Many people will use those terms interchangeably, and in many cases, spe specific examples, that is interchangeable. The antagonist is the villain, or is a villain, and the vil people doing the villainous actions are the antagonists. But they're not always. Um, often the antagonist is... Well, always the antagonist is driving opposition to what the protagonist is involved with. They're not necessarily involved in villainous actions, though. And in many cases, there are villainous characters who are not the antagonist, and sometimes they're even allied with the protagonist or they are the protagonist. So it's important to separate those things uh, and think of them uh, differently because when you separate them in that way, it allows you as an author of whatever your medium is to treat them differently and think about what you want to accomplish with the characters. Um, the ultimate answer, by the way, at the end of this is it really depends on what you're trying to do with the character, what role the character actually plays in how the story unfolds, how the protagonist is supposed to interact with the antagonist or the villains, uh, and how it's supposed to motivate or stymie the motivations of the protagonist or protagonists. So um, as an example of villains who are protagonists or allies of the protagonist, I can talk about a couple of examples. One of them is Dean Domino, which was a character that Chris Ablone wrote in Dead Money, which was the first expansion for Fall at New Vegas. Uh, I will use a lot of uh, you know, genre, you know, fiction or gaming examples for this, just because I sort of figure people are familiar with them. So Dean Domino is a really terrible person. I think most, most people would probably say Dean is very terrible, uh, but he is allied with the um, the courier, who is the protagonist in this in the circumstances, and you're both trying to essentially get out of the villa. Uh, the villa. But uh, Dean is terrible. He's a horrible person, and he will turn against you and do other things uh, that are very nasty. And he has been a horrible person in the past. Um, that said, Elijah is also horrible and terrible. But it's a case where Elijah and Dean are absolutely not um, direct allies. They're very much in conflict with each other, but you have someone who is a, you know, a pretty clear villain that is in a circumstance where they're allied with the uh, the player. Uh, also, just in standard sort of fantasy fiction, you have Stormbringer. Um, so Elric is in Michael Moorcock's books. Elric is the protagonist. Um, he does a lot of really bad things. Uh, he is an anti-hero by most definitions. Um, that said, a lot of the people around him who are in opposition to him are also really terrible. So um, your coon and those cool guys are actually very not cool. And so as antagonists, they stand apart from Elric. Uh, but then Elric's own sword, Stormbringer, which is a major character throughout the story, is horrible and terrible. And it actually, in many ways, could be considered one of the major antagonists of the series. Um, it's an ally of Elric in some ways and in some times, but it also does these incredibly horrible things. Um, I mean, all the way up until the end of the series. So Stormbringer is a villain and an antagonist, but not in a way that is usually front and center. Um, so that's another sort of interesting way that you can uh, handle a character in, the, in those roles. Um, so talking about sympathy, which is an important element, I think, in, in the portrayal of a lot of villains and villainous characters and antagonists. Um, it kind of depends on why you're using sympathy, what you want that sympathetic emotion to accomplish. So it can make the antagonist more complex. At, a very, at the very least, it provides a motive. So um, when a villain 
has a reason for doing something. It might not be an excuse for doing that thing, but at least it is a reason. And so it helps you understand what their motivations are. Without that motivation, regardless of whether or not you sympathize with them, they can feel very flat because you really just don't understand what drives the character to do what they're doing. Um, and in many cases, you are not intended to agree with that as the reader or as the player. It's not really part of the author's um, goal. So they'll include, the authors will include a motivation or a reason, but it's not an excuse. It's not really intended to be an excuse. Uh, I was reading Dune recently, and Dr. Yui is, uh, you know, he's a troubled guy. <laughs> and he, he has reasons for doing the things that he does in the story. Um, and you can sympathize with him, but I don't think a lot of people would have made the choice that he made. Um, but at least it's understandable on some level why he did those things. Um, and the characters in the setting themselves absolutely do not forgive Yui for doing what he did. So they understand it on some level, but they condemn him for doing it, which is likely what most readers would do um, at the same time. Uh, also, in some cases, you can have the protagonists sort of show the darkest sides of the antagonists or the villains, like the depths of villainy, to justify an extreme response by the protagonists. Uh, the two examples that I was thinking of are both, they're very similar actually, when I, when I went back to look at them, are um, Portia dealing with Shylock in The Merchant of Venice, which is the, the quality of mercy is not strained um, speech, and then Shylock's nastiness following that, um, setting aside the fact that that is a terrible racist play. But in any case, as a character, it does highlight the sense where Portia tries to give Shylock a way out, or rather to save himself in advance of being, uh, you know, basically blindsided when Portia turns the tables on him. But he is merciless in a lot of ways, and uh, so that his mercilessness sort of justifies, or could be seen as justifying why he's treated uh, badly later on. Uh, similarly, Henry V, when Henry V is dealing with the conspirators uh, in Henry V uh, before they launch for France, he gives uh, the conspirators, before they're revealed, the conspirators do not know they've been found out, and Henry gives them an opportunity to show themselves as merciful people by showing mercy to a man who, you know, kind of minorly assaulted the king because he had drank too much, and the conspirators are merciless, and they say, nope, don't forgive him, treat him very horribly, and Henry sort of lets them hang themselves, really. Uh, but that giving those villains the chance to really be villainous uh, helps in the minds of the, in the, of the reader or the viewer understand why then the protagonists deal with them very severely. They, uh, you know, they basically are merciless and are terrible, and so then the protagonists can feel justified, and the reader and the viewer can feel justified in allowing them to uh, treat them severely. Um, so in a lot of cases, it's simply a pretext. So the motivation that uh, an antagonist shows is simply a pretext for why they're doing what they're doing. So it's a reason, and it's a motivation. But again, much like Yui, it's not really meant to... Uh, well, in the case of Yui, you, you can sympathize. But in some cases, you're not really meant to sympathize at all. You're just meant to understand. So um, if you go look at Beowulf, so Grendel is bothered by noise. And so Grendel goes to attack um, the people making the noise. And, you know, that's a suit. No, I, I doubt a lot of people would try to kill uh, their neighbors for making too much noise. Well, I mean, maybe today. Um, who knows? People are pretty severe. But... Uh, that's Grendel's reason, but that's just a motivation. It's not really a strong justi uh, justifying reason. And then after Grendel dies, Grendel's mother comes to uh, just out of revenge. And so it's a very clear, it's understandable, like, yeah, I got it. Uh, that's really there just to present the conflict for the protagonist. Like, here's the reason why this antagonist or this villain is doing this horrible stuff. Um, and that, and then, so that puts the, the protagonist in opposition. So it's a very simple, like, that's it, and no more explanations required. Um, and then there are some cases where the antagonism or the villainy is not really the primary thing. It's 
it's it drives the action, but it's not a very strong focus. So you don't even actually need to sympathize. You just need to understand the importance that it has for the protagonist. So to use a very classic example, you could uh, think of Orestes. So Orestes actually comes after a long series of events where Agamemnon is returning home from war. Uh, he's stranded with his men on an island, and the gods require him to sacrifice his uh, daughter Ephigenia to leave. And he sacrifices his daughter Ephigenia, and then when he gets home, Clytemnestra, who's his wife and the mother of Ephigenia, uh, kills him. She murders her husband out of revenge. But then when you get to Orestes, so Orestes and Electra are the children of Clytemnestra and Agamemnon, sorry. And the way that Orestes, the, uh, the play starts, or at least one of the plays starts, is um, Orestes kills Clytemnestra because Apollo keeps uh, telling him that it's his duty to avenge his father's death. But in killing um, his mother, he's committed matricide. <laughs> so then the Furies are tormenting him, and he's caught in the classic Greek agony where he, um, he is torn between two competing justifiable actions. The gods are telling him, you have to avenge your father's death, and the Furies are punishing him for killing his mother, because now he's committed matricide. Uh, and then the struggle that follows that is really about Orestes trying to get out of the circumstance. So what Agamemnon did and what Clytemnestra did before that, which really pushed the motivation of Orestes, they're not, um, I don't want to say they're not important, but they're not the central Orestes is not driving against them. Orestes is driving against all the forces surrounding him that are um, pulling him in different directions and trying to, you know, basically make him pay for what he did or what he didn't do. Um, and then the other one, which is much more contemporary, is Sophie's Choice, where Sophie, the titular character, is not, um, you know, her, the choice that she made... Um, the character that forced her to make that choice is not particularly important. I mean, his, his role is important, but uh, it's the fact that she had to make that choice and then live with the consequences of it. And so the incidental uh, action there, like clearly he's not, he's not really the antagonist, even though arguably he set her life down this path of extreme duress and difficulty for the rest of her life. Um, the other characters in the story who are closer to the contemporary time um, you know, those are the ones who are, in many ways, the antagonists who are driving the conflicts because they're involved in Sophie's personal life um, and their own lives, and she's involved in theirs. Um, so that's just another way to look at it. Uh, now, getting to games specifically, after I spent 13 minutes talking about general stuff, um, I think if fiction, if the fiction that is involved is interactive, whether it's a game or just a, maybe a story, an interactive fiction story, if the player is really meant to make a meaningful full choice, um, as opposed to kind of going through something that is more didactic on the part of the author, like if the author wants to make a very specific point and it's didactic, then the choice that the player makes or the reader makes is not necessarily supposed to be something that is motivated uh, or I, sh I should say validated by the author. However, if it is, if that is the intent where the author wants you to view a number of different ways to go as equally valid with their own consequences, um, then I think that sympathy or the potential for sympathy is important because if that sympathy can be read as justification in the minds of many readers, then that justification can be a reason for the player or the viewer to take that character's side. So if they're originally set up in opposition to the character, now they can say, you know what, I've changed my mind because I don't just have token sympathy for this character. I actually believe that what they did was justified and is justified, and so now I'm on their side and I'm going to help them out. Um, it's really about putting the reader or the player in that sort of the position of agony. You're putting them in the position of Orestes, where there are two good or bad, or equally good, equally bad, sort of solutions for the player or the reader to decide between, and a lot of that is going to come down to their own values, or at least the values they've developed within the, the setting. So this is something we really tried to do with Fallout New Vegas. When you play Fallout New Vegas, 
The initial motivation of the villain and the antagonist is Benny. Uh, but Benny is... Uh, you know, he's not the he's not the end, clearly. He's a, he's a motivation to get you going through the world and to understand what the larger conflict is. The conflict is much bigger than uh, Benny, and Benny in some ways is very petty. He's a petty guy, and he's caught up in um, trying to play politics. He's, he's, he's a small player underneath the big players, and he's trying to get what he can out of the situation. Uh, when you actually do get to Benny and get past Benny. Well, one, you do have many choices in how to deal with Benny. Some people are going to be motivated purely by revenge and his reasons and his excuses are not enough. Other people are very forgiving and they try to get him out of the problems, especially when they see that he is caught up with Caesar um, and they might view Caesar as being at least someone to oppose more than Benny. But really in revealing what the conflict is, Caesar is the driver of the conflict, but the player really can choose their own antagonist in some ways because because you are a protagonist who chooses your own way through the story um, you are going to decide who is in opposition to you you have certain goals and you think well I think the wasteland and I think New Vegas are going to be better if this group achieves victory and accomplishes what they set out to do so if you are able to make that choice and align yourself, then you are essentially setting up your own antagonist. Um, but it's being done in such a way where we try to make all those paths more or less valid. Um, you know, mechanically and, and quest-wise, obviously, uh, Caesar's Legion has, you know, some problems there. But the idea was that each of those paths is um, considered a valid way for the player to go. And the choices that the player makes... Um, you know, ultimately set them up for that antagonism. If you weren't able to sympathize with the groups involved, then you would never be able to sort of go over to their side and make that choice. And some people often find that they turn over time. So they think Caesar is really horrible, then they think he's less horrible, and most people most people still don't ally with them, but they're like, okay, well, you have reasons, but they're still insane, terrible reasons, so we're not going to ally with you. A lot of people start out with NCR, and then over time they think, actually, at the upper level, there's a lot of things wrong with NCR, and so I've changed my mind, and I want to support House. And then some people, after supporting House for a while, they think that he has problems too, and then they don't want to support him anymore, and they either go back to NCR, or they decide to go for independent. Um, but anyway, I guess the point is that with interactive fiction, those sympathies, if they're really intended to help the player uh, motivate them towards picking a side that might have initially been in opposition with them, then the antagonist needs to be convincing, not just sympathetic, but convincing and justifiable. Um, otherwise, the player isn't going to be put in the agonizing situation, and the agony is not in the sense of depression. <laughs> <laughs> and deep sadness, but the agony and in sense of struggle, uh, because those decisions should be somewhat of a struggle for the players, and uh, at least when they talk about their experiences with other players, it can make them feel like they're in a struggle to justify what they've done uh, to other people, and that they're, they're sort of putting other people on the spot to justify the things that they've done. So, I hope that explains my position on it. <laughs> um, it really does depend on the role, what you want, that sympathy, and that reason to accomplish for the story that you're trying to tell. Thanks.